Welcome to In the Landscape, a podcast on all things landscape design and care related with your hosts, Kate and Charles Sadler. Hi, thanks for joining us for another episode of King Gardens In the Landscape. This is our weekly podcast on all things landscape design and care related, which I believe I say in our little intro. So there it is again. (laughs) I'm your host, Kate Sadler, and with me in studio is my co-host, Charles. Good to be here. Hey, so we are having another week of interesting developments. We sort of have family scattered throughout the United States. So we've had one family member that was evacuated from a home in the Napa area. And we're hunkering a little for the two potential hurricanes. It looks like their tracks are not quite going to hit us full on. And in Napa, um, that was forest fires. Yes, those brush fires that, that spring up. I guess they had dry lightning and it's, it's quite serious drought conditions out there. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, of course, there's a fire season. The landscape is designed to burn in some cases, and they do controlled burns, and they have things like goats that can clear brush, but um, it's just such a a large area. You know, our heart goes out to anyone who has been displaced. We certainly hope everybody has been kept physically safe with the, the foresight of many of these evacuations. I know some folks, though, having the fire so fast, it can happen sort of overnight, and you're, you're fleeing your home before you have time to to even register what's happening. So our hearts go out to anyone affected by that. We're also mindful of, of pets and livestock and, and the wildlife that are mm-hmm. um, caught up in these, in these fires. And, you know, there's an ecosystem of flora that rebounds, certainly. Right, it's um, like pioneer species that are designed to come in. Is it the, the, the redwoods, one of those trees, the seed pods, they're designed, they open in a fire condition. Like that might be the only time they open. (laughs) Yes, there is. Yeah. There are trees that respond that way, but you know, it's hard for us because our human lifespan is not that of those giant trees. And so if we lose them in our lifetime, Mm -hmm. we're not likely to see the same again. A thousand year old tree. Yeah. So it's a heavy time. My family member is certainly safe and his home currently is safe. So we're just waiting to see if the latest lightning storms touch off anything. I mean, it's the hard part is it's kind of the start of the season and already we're seeing pretty epic destruction. Yeah, Um, it's tenuous that living on the edge of the wilderness, it's incredibly beautiful. The flora, the fauna, the vistas. I mean, it's like this connection with nature so strong. Yeah, their home is quite quite a bit out there. Um, Of course, there are whole towns that are in danger with these fires. As we saw a couple years ago, And so, you know, how do we plant differently? How do we build differently? What can we do to kind of accept that this is probably going to be an ongoing situation for a while as we haven't, we haven't really addressed or reversed climate change and the effects it's having. So, so that's tough. You know, the hurricanes will probably bypass, not bypass, but sideswipe us, but our neighbors to the east are in in a fair amount of Which would be Louisiana. Yeah, eastern Texas, Louisiana, that wonderful home you visited. um, Oh, Longview. Longview. You know, we're thinking of everybody and and hope to hope that things go well. Everybody's battened down the hatches and and that we can face whatever rebuilding or recovery there is after. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little tense around here, which is not the point of today's podcast, but maybe it is a little bit. Maybe it is a little bit (laughs) because we're thinking through the ways in which people inhabit different landscapes, the ways that we may be changing our dream landscape as if we've become disillusioned with the city in a time of pandemic, for example, or we're living in an area where our proximity to wilderness has become untenable and we need to kind of pick up stakes and move. It's a challenge even in the best of times to move Mm -hmm. and to move to an entirely different climate is a challenge. And of course, moving to a different lifestyle is a challenge. So going from complete urbanite to, you know, rural (laughs) 
living in the Adirondacks or something in a log cabin, it may seem appealing, but there's a lot of work that goes into making that transition successful. It's cultural. I mean, like people experience culture shock, which I think we experienced that coming to Texas. We didn't necessarily even realize it until we were in it a while. It's just things you take for granted. The things are maybe subtly different and perceptions are different and approaches and like that word visit, right? People People would say, oh, we'll visit. And so that could mean a conversation on the phone or it could mean physically in person. Right, yeah. And, and the same person would use it interchangeably. And so they might be in another state and they say, oh, can you visit on Tuesday? And I'm thinking, am I going to get on an airplane? Because I need to prepare if I, in three days if I'm going to be on an airplane. And they actually meant we're going to talk on the phone, which would be a visit about your in-person visit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, Which it's, we had to really cl- we had to clarify it sometimes. Yeah. So there's this, um, I guess, a preparation, a willingness to learn, a willingness to have things hit road bumps, I guess, if you're going to, you know, make a big change in where you're living. And of course, something like bringing in the landscape professionals who are familiar with that area or taking on the challenge of of doing the plant research and figuring out what the weather patterns are for your area. All of that can make, I guess, in our opinion, having done it recently can make the transition a little easier. Mm -hmm. Um, And especially if it's happening due to some sort of necessity, you know, finding your new home, I guess, can be sort of an empowered process if you think of it that way. And in a way, accept that things will be different. Like even if it's just moving to a suburb and you've lived in the city or or from a city, a suburb into the city and having to make those adjustments. So as you've guessed, it'll be a three part (laughs) series, uh, one episode for each of those regions, rural, which is and of course, these are there are lots of variations within these definitions, but sort of a rural property, the, what the landscape considerations you might have if you're making that change to the suburban, if you need to move in a little closer to schools that are going to suit a growing family or something like that. And then finally, the urban environment and how, you know, how we can maximize our relationship to the landscape, even when we're living in the city. Right? Mm-hmm. I have a friend who's moving closer to Fort Tryon Park in Manhattan. Which is northern Manhattan. And it, yeah, the northwestern side. And so you can look across to the Palisades, across the Hudson River. Which are about thousand, like a thousand foot cliffs. Yes. It's very dramatic. And and moving is hard. I mean, he has to pack up an apartment and that's no small thing. He's feat a in professional Manhattan. musician, right? Yeah. So there's a piano that's going to be involved in the move. And, you know, I was thinking like, I was just reminiscing about autumn in New York. I mean, there's a reason there's a song about it. And, That's a, and it's, it's, it plays a role in, in many movies, absolutely. romantic comedies. Yes. <laughs> and so the fact that his proximity now is closer to this one park that has amazing terraces and the color change, and he can look across to the Palisades where there's just that cliff of, of fall foliage. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so exciting. And it really takes, it gives you something to look forward to. In terms mm-hmm. of moving, even though things are different, even if you're just moving, you know, a few blocks north. <laughs> you think of it as an adventure, it's helpful. Yeah. You think, oh, it'll, it'll be different. It may be different. And then think whatever comes, that open-mindedness, that's helped us. Well, and also being, you know, oh, not that this is easy, but being willing to admit that something isn't for you. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we sometimes, one of our strategies is to kind of scope out the area that we think we might want to move. So we did a lot of, well, we were lucky because there was family here. So we visited Texas quite a bit and there were things that we really, really enjoyed about it. And so it gave us that, that something to look forward to, but I mean, we could have hated it. <laughs> like we could have, it could be hard to come visit. And, and then we say, well, it sounds nice, but maybe it's not for us. Or, or there are these like hurricanes. I'm not thrilled with that. I grew up in earthquake and fire country, so you think it wouldn't bother me. But, but I'm, you know, I mean, you do get warning, but it's every year, so I'm like, there's flooding. Yeah, um, there's a phenomenon. Maybe it relates a little with the soft drinks with the Coke and Pepsi challenge, which was decades ago now. And so Pepsi was more popular in the taste test. When you had a small sip of it, people mm-hmm. liked it better. Mm-hmm. But if you don't generally drink a sip. You drink a whole, 
whatever that would be, a cup, a mug. And so Coke was a better experience. So it's similar to visiting. There's places you visit, people take maybe mm-hmm. vacation somewhere. We love this. But then living there day to day, the the luster and and the might wear off. Yeah. So it's something to sort of I guess there's no way to know until you experience it. So I guess it's a combination. If you have the luxury of, you know, scoping things out and seeing if something's for you, maybe volunteering at a so we're gonna talk rural today. So maybe volunteering at a farm, going and staying at an Airbnb in a region just to see if it's something you like. That's a very privileged take on the time and energy and money you can invest in seeing if a lifestyle is for you. Uh, For anybody who's being displaced as a matter of like, you know, financial or or ecological crisis. Yes. I mean, of course, it's a whole different consideration and in that case it's what can you do to help the new place feel like home and Mm -hmm. and what might you want to be aware of if this is the track that you're kind of required to go for whatever reason to make the most of it and to make it feel like you Mm -hmm. can you can handle it now having this the some of the special properties i've worked on some of them are very large hundreds or thousands of acres having and then when you learn the history of the site so sometimes it's much before the owners that i'm working for and you'll learn, oh, when someone that developed this property, they brought plants that were meaningful to them. And they're sometimes plants not from that specific region. Mm-hmm. And so those plants go on to have a life, which they might struggle a little. And so plants can give a sense of home, of comfort. At the end of one's life, I've done some of my design work in graduate school was healthcare design and hospice gardens. And it I think the things that were familiar was very important. Mm-hmm. So not having the most unusual plant, but having daisies, black-eyed Susans, lilacs, things that were familiar and comforting was an important component. And so relocating to a new region or going to, to the country, having those familiar elements. And pe- people do that even if they're not aware of it. Well, and it's also, I mean, if, if you're in the design practice or you're doing a design for someone, interrogating that history of them is helpful because mm-hmm. they, they may have certain blossoms in the spring that they recall or a smell or a fruit or, or, you know, a specific species. And you can actually bring a lot to your design if you're sensitive to that. So, yes, mm-hmm. we have a standard palette of plants that we love to work with. They look great. They flourish. But if you get to know somebody and they say, oh, well, you know, our our family vacation home is out in Hawaii. And, and so you're like, oh, well, you know, what is it about that region that you love? Can we bring some of that into your landscape here? Like the hibiscus flower, let's say, or the, or the bird of paradise, mm-hmm. or that might be hard to grow, but if you're focused on it, there's all kinds of ways to grow anything. <laughs> yes. Yes. We've even brought a few plants with us. We're sure they're not invasive <laughs> and some of them have not fared as well, to be honest, but it's, it's us giving a try and seeing what happens. So we are, we did live in urban environments. We moved to like an urban suburban environment. So like a a commuter city right outside New York City, which I would consider still fairly densely populated. The the housing was a certain like townhouses. You could buy like a house with a yard, but that's not quite what we lived in. Now we're in a suburban environment where it's very like fenced for four walls of fences and houses and Nice streets to walk on, but different considerations, Mm -hmm. certain freedoms that we didn't have when we were living with neighbors up above. Right. But also certain restrictions because of homeowners associations. Right. We we probably couldn't plant a vegetable garden in our front yard. Right. That would would probably probably get like a citation or whatever the, the term is. Well, and we aspire to live in the country because we'd like to have, we'd like to continue to develop some business opportunities that we think would be well suited to a Mm -hmm. rural environment. Again, we're getting to know the area here in Texas and rural and urban are very close to each other. You have all these farm to market roads, which is like most common road name when you're outside of of a city, whether it's Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, the farm to market road is everywhere. It's like uh, repeated over and over. Well, and part of the part of our job as as people kind of considering this kind of move is to really assess carefully what works and what doesn't, how challenging it might be. So challenging in a city, for example, is like 
I moved into a sixth floor walk up with no laundry. There was no laundry in the basement of the building. <laughs> we had to schlep our laundry to the, luckily we had a laundromat on our street, on our block, but then that closed because they were gentrifying the neighborhood. So then we had to go far. It was a mess. So if that's not for you, no, if you have, can afford a washer dryer in your apartment, more power to you. <laughs> but, but, you know, um, this was just starting out in my own career. That's hard work. So could I go out and tend to animals and clear brush? Possibly, but it's a whole other, it's, you know, it's buggy. It's hot here in Texas. Like, is mm-hmm. that I could do winters in New York. Can I do summers in Texas? It's really like before getting, I guess I just want to say I have tremendous respect for people who make a go of it in these challenging environments. And farming is hard work. So it may seem like rural is for you aesthetically, but that's maybe a different property, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there are these like rural adjacent suburbs where you get like a nice piece of land, your your farm style home, but you're not working an actual farm. Is it a working landscape, right? Yeah. yeah. And the farm aesthetic, I mean, the, the clients that I visit that are in that kind of condition, whether no matter where it is, you have to learn to do quite a bit yourself. No, mm. I mean, to be blunt, no matter what your income is, because mm. you, your truck gets stuck. I mean, I've had that work at some of these properties. You have to figure out how to get out of there. Like it's, there's no one, maybe there's your cell phone died. You're far away from anybody. It doesn't matter what your bank account is. You might have to put a winch and pull the vehicle out. I had to roll a, roll a log out of the way the other day that was, which I was stuck and I couldn't see why am I stuck. <laughs> and it was a vehicle I wasn't familiar with. And I mean, it's not a crisis, but you have to figure it out. Or you might have like a long walk. And so that's, I guess it's humbling. In an urban condition, it can be very similar. Yes, that's you, true. You just take for granted, oh, well, I'll find a parking spot or I'll have it delivered. Not necessarily. You know, there's, they'll say we don't deliver to that neighborhood. Right. Or in, in a rural setting, it might be the same. Like, you know, have furniture delivered. Well, we don't come that far out. It's like an extra so much to have that done. Right. Of course, in the rural environment, fencing is really important. So you're, you're, there's a lot to maintain. Like even if the building is somewhat humble, you know, you're maintaining fences, gates. I think maybe that's a reference to the James Harriet, all creatures stories. Oh, but right. it's like oh, you take, those. so it's good to take an assistant with you if you're visiting a rural property. So you have someone to hop out and open and close the gates. <laughs> so you have to do it yourself. It's a real pain. And getting to know the landscape, especially the unmanicured landscape. Mm-hmm. How do you manage a landscape that's, I would, I guess, naturalistic? It's very, very rare that landscapes are completely untouched. So maybe it was heavily grazed by uh, cattle, but is now reverting to, again, hobby farms. And so things are growing back up again. Do mm-hmm. you have any anything to share there? Because you have a lot of experience now getting out in these oh, landscapes. Right. I mean, the, there's these different terms. You could say, do you have a mowing regime? Mm. So if you don't mow in many conditions, it will become, it'll become woody vegetation, shrubs or trees. So the landscapes. When I visit a landscape, it could be deceptive. It could look like this beautiful meadow. And there's often, there may be trees, species, native species of trees and shrubs that are beautiful. It might be attracts wildlife. I mean, hunting and fishing on some of these properties, that's like a big component. Mm-hmm. Or riding horses or all types of things to do with horses. So maintaining the landscape for these different programs there's a level of sophistication, which is not apparent. I mean, how do you mow a rocky, rough uh, landscape? You need special equipment. There are, maybe there's, on some of these sites I visit, there's contractors that advertise. We do that. We do, like, we'll grade your road periodically. Your gravel road might get washed out, mm-hmm. and they'll do the mowing that is specialized. I mean, it might be a $120,000 mower to do that, you know, that can handle steep slopes and and keeping brush at bay. And there may be utilities. Maybe there's wires. Maybe we, you might be responsible f- to maintain that. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of eminent domain that can go along with purchasing sort of rural parcels, I guess. Um, and so knowing what the mineral rights are 
I mean, we're no expert mm. on on this subject, but we do know that there may be issues of of right of way for utilities and whether you maintain it or you're required to give permission to the utility to maintain it. Being cognizant of that as you go into rural places can be helpful, just sort of an, an awareness. But if we're talking about like a, a suburban residential property, we talk about things like irrigation. But of course, you may be in a region where that's a totally different concept. It's, it's your drinking water's on a well, you're putting in a septic tank. And so thinking through if you're going to, I mean, watering whole properties, not likely, right? You're going to want to be planting maybe more creatively if that's the case. Right. Maybe there's, in some states, the, the state or the federal uh, foresters might be available. The local, regional, or federal government, they want to encourage good practices. And mm-hmm. so but that's a process. So there's consultants. And like we act as, we have that role occasionally where we're a consultant for these large tracks. And there, there could be a pond consultant, a soil. There's like a level of complexity. It's, it's not as simple as just hiring a contractor. Oh, I want to build a road. I want to plant some trees. What I see on some of these projects I'm involved in, things go badly. And so the plants all die. There's some condition in the soil that wasn't apparent. You have to sometimes backtrack and say, oh boy, you know, we, it's not as straightforward as it appears. So what about designing? You know, we talked in our out sort of like outbuilding episode about maybe helping the buildings on a larger proper, property relate to each other or even small. I mean, we talked about sheds and things like that. But what about designing for a rural property? What are some things to think of? You have long driveways. Sometimes it's hard to find the entrance to a farm if you've ever, I don't know, somehow the wayfinding in the country seems very challenging to me. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's on purpose, but what would your suggestions be? Yeah, some of these properties, Google will take you to one road, but there's not actually an entrance there. Mm -hmm. The entrance might be on the side road. When I visit these, the the owners often will give me instructions. They say, Google will take you to the main road, but you have to enter on the dirt road. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll meet you there. I mean, some this level of complexity, which I guess it can be charming, but it can be a nuisance too. If you have a big delivery coming, you might have to wait all day for that tractor trailer. So let's see. So in a large scale landscape, I mean, even when it's multiple acres, this can be helpful having the entrance, like the user the owner entrance or visitor entrance, then there can be a service entrance, which, I mean, that might sound pretentious, but it's very practical. So for lawn mowing, for large deliveries, having, so doing master planning. And so at this rural scale, it's still designed, but it's at the planning scale where you're not thinking of which light fixture or which hardware you're thinking, what's the scale of the road? Can a large, like can a tractor trailer enter? Sometimes for various things, you need that. Well, and certainly when you get to the home and surrounding maybe gardens, you can get down to that detail. Certain the fencing of mm-hmm. these great ranch fences they have here, you know, right. they have space for a sign and things like that. So you can't, there is the fun detail component, mm-hmm. but you're suggesting that like the program is, you should be thinking the entire property, even if it seems really big, right? <laughs> you, you need to take it all into consideration and figure out what your plan for it is. If it's, if it's thousands of acres, let's say that would be, my brother's been involved in properties where it's tens of thousands, like a forestry property with quarries. And so on that Almost no matter what the scale is, there should be good wayfinding. Like, can you find what you need, the entrance, the service entrance? So engineers, we work with engineers and we do studies for a turning radius to make sure the entrances, that they're usable depending on the size of the vehicle. There's signage, lighting, security, which could be gates or fences. And then even from the beginning, having an idea board. And so... And some of these historic properties will be a color palette that's mm-hmm. repeated. Like it's, it's a red metal roof, you see that, or it's, it's brick walkways. And so that could be part of the idea board. And then that could be repeated throughout the property. And it would go through the filter. Maybe at the entrance, it's more dressed up. But then on a practical level, maybe there's fencing needed throughout the whole property. And when it's, these details are not considered, 
it can cause a problem where it's like, boy, what we, what we actually see is this hideous agricultural fence. I wish we had, I wish the designer had input on that because it could have been an asset. And so working with folks that know the local community, what's, what materials are available, people to install them, that's part of the factor too. There, there might be the beautiful material, but nobody in your region has ever worked with that. So, so we try to do that, to do some due diligence. This is what we suggest. There is a local inst- installer. I've come across that where there's a supplier, but there's not a local contractor for certain kind of paving materials. And the company said, we'd, we'd send our national team, they would do the installation. And so is that practical? And then we often lay that out for the client. Here's what we suggest. Here's the roadblocks, the hurdles. This might take longer but it'll be a great solution, or here's a simpler approach. Well, I like the idea of the master plan um, because I, you know, what I love is the intentionality, Mm. if that's the right word, where, you know, but hey, I mean, we're not, we're not going to be operating on a very huge budget here. So we're not going to be putting in horse barns and stables (laughs) that are all going to be painted the, you know, the colors of in the landscape farms (laughs) farms <laughs> or whatever. So it's a real luxury. But as we did mention in that outbuilding episode, there's a way to kind of have a plan and then roll it out over time so that, as you said, there is a, there is a color scheme. There is a continuity to maybe the front gate has a certain stone and then that stone is repeated closer to the home so that there's just a feel of continuity to the property. I, some of these properties feel so large to me Unless you're talking about like, and again, these were people with unimaginable wealth, like the biggest states in England or in the Northeastern United States, where it's like you have that unlimited budget. And so you really are reforming the entire landscape at once. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, here's Capability Brown's idea. Get some carts and oxen and hundreds of men and we'll just do it, you know? Right. (laughs) I mean, it's... But if you're not operating on that scale, it's still having that overarching vision, which implementing design principles or talking with a designer, I think, can really help with. And, the, and even things in on-site nursery can be developed. So that might sound, that's crazy, but not necessarily. If there is time, we say, we're, we want to sort of roll out this plan over 10 years. Mm-hmm. And so we'll put in some of the key roads, key buildings. Some of these properties we work on are... There is a business on the property of the whole range of spectrum. It could be a residence and there's some type of business occurring there. Mm -hmm. So there's often the immediate needs and then the idea board, the planning. Materials can be stockpiled, whether it's stone materials, bricks. And so... Well, especially if you're going to do some of those antique... I mean, we had that episode on materials where we talked about repurposing materials. So mm -hmm. it may take a while to get the volume that you need. But if you've got that vision and you're starting to you know, get antique farm fixtures and antique farm. I don't know, I'm getting excited thinking about <laughs> like old farm tools. You could go be a picker kind of like that right. like great show. I mean, those uh, materials on History Channel. Those like weathered bricks and old granite curbs that could become paving or that can easily be stockpiled. Mm-hmm. And so it's to have that delivery made, it's then like you become your own uh, sort of nucleus. And the same with plants where a plant nursery could be set up the trees can be bought just for a matter of dollars a piece. And then in five years, it, that tree is, is 15 times its value. And it's just with a minimal input, it's been potted, irrigated. Uh, so there's ways, of, there's ways of economies of scale. Maybe there's a certain kind of oak tree. Like we found it's hard to locate a post oak that's not in commerce. It's possible to grow one from an acorn. Now, it might be the return might be low. Maybe you have to grow... Mm-hmm. Maybe only get one for every 20, but so there's ways of making it unique and special. And it's not necessarily more expensive either. It could be less expensive because you're, you're building, you're getting the materials, which, which are important to you, which might be rare or expensive. Well, and one recommendation to make, so if it, you know, if you have your own sort of design ideas and, and you just want to kind of do things yourself, that's a fabulous way to go the one place to really perhaps consult, as you mentioned, you can have like a whole team of people, but an arborist, a horticulturalist, somebody who can give you a sense of the 
scope of the maintenance. Mm -hmm. So you know what you can handle yourself and what may be too much. Like, oh, all the trees are overgrown. Uh, The wind breaks around the house are going to pose a danger if you ever have a, a, hear a hurricane blow through or in the Northeast or somebody who might consult if there is fire danger in your neck of the woods so that Mm -hmm. you have your team of goats (laughs) to (laughs) clear brush. Just so you have a sense, if this isn't the environment you grew up in, you have a sense from, from someone who's an expert on, you know, what would a plan look like? What can we do? this year, five years, 10 years, and what do we need to do to maintain it every year and in terms of seasons? Right. We've worked with realtors and people that are that will purchase land to help assess that. And you can pretty rapidly do, as, my, as the decades go by with my experience, I can pretty rapidly do an estimate. You know, screening would be this, roads, I call a road contractor, this, mm-hmm. we're going to use this kind of gravel, how much is that? you know, per linear foot or per mile or whatever, <laughs> whatever the scale is, and you can pretty rapidly give the client a snapshot. Mm. As people often want to know, there's the upfront cost and there's a the maintenance cost. And I mean, with something like lawn, the upfront cost is very minimal to throw down grass seed. The maintenance cost, it's like one of the most expensive things to maintain, to mm-hmm. keep to mow every week. And water and weed and so, feed <laughs> and many things are like that it yeah. appears like oh it's easy inexpensive we'll plant these hedges is, is there someone that can trim those is, mm. you know, it could cause a problem all right so we're, we're getting close to the full length of our usual episode is there anything you'd like to mention that we haven't covered in the episode so far well let's see like with this rural scale the planning like someone that would do regional planning on a civic scale so a lot of it is planning and then it does filter down to landscape architecture and landscape design. But really, I've been called in on some projects that, that were not that extensive, but the scale, the person that was the design person didn't have experience with larger scale. Mm-hmm. And so what they were suggesting was beautiful, but the plants weren't big enough or the wasn't suited. So having so on very large scale, there are folks that I would consult like a wildlife management person or a pond person mm-hmm. or a structural engineer, someone that's going to think of the roads. And so knowing, I guess, knowing your limits and not being afraid to, to consult others. Mm-hmm. That's with the, with the rural scale, the wells, the septic, the roads, wildlife, fire. I know in California, there are, I've read a little bit about there's guidelines there needs to be a certain area between the house and the vegetation. And then some of these Southern California homes are now building, there's fire code where it has to be mm-hmm. concrete. So oh, the, I mean, smart. so it looks like a, it can look like a bomb shelter. And then the designers, the architects, mm-hmm. our job is to make it look pretty. So it's going to be safe as safe as possible. And there's so working with local folks, even if there's cases where we're not, where we're not as familiar with, the local. So we always team up with a local expert. Great. All right. Well, we will talk about the suburban scale next episode. Uh, We are changing up our recording and publishing schedule just a little bit. We might be coming out on Thursdays in North America, which might be Fridays, if you're in Australia, for example. Um, but, we, you know, keep looking for us. We'll, we'll continue to do weekly episodes. We're just kind of shifting over a little bit here for our work schedule. You have some uh, some great things coming up. You just did a, a class with an organization, an online class that I think went well about mm-hmm. selecting the right plant. We're continuing to adapt our production schedule for our classes, which we're working hard on. If you see them published, they're ready to go. Um, mm-hmm. You can take them asynchronously all at once. And, and then there's some interesting things in the works, which we can't talk about right now, but potentially very exciting, uh, which would be so fun to share on our podcast. Well, if as we, we get out in the world. If, I mean, if we make it work. We get, we'll get. see. We're taking calls is, is how this that's process right. goes. I mean, we get, you get out in the world and it's, there's a critical mass where you there's visibility. You mm-hmm. get invited or asked to be to participate and mm-hmm. be part of things, and yeah, that's exciting. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Could totally totally fall apart. 
So we won't mention any, any specifics just yet, but stay tuned and hopefully we'll have more to share. So if you have any thoughts on these topics, we love interacting on social media. Anytime someone adds us, it's a thrill. So <laughs> please feel free. Send us your photos. Those are our, our, our absolute favorites. Send us your questions. And as always, you can send corrections. Believe, believe me, if you know where mm-hmm. people grow post oaks, by the thousands, give us a call right. <laughs> and we'll mention it on the air. So um, thank you for joining us for another week. And we look forward to talking suburban scale next week. That's right. It's kind of exciting to know what we're doing next week. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we tease episodes, but this is really the first time we've done like a three-part so, like planned. And it might lead to more series. Yeah, it's, there is some nice continuity to it. So like hopefully if you like it, you can let us know. If you hate it, you can let us know. So. Thanks for listening. We hope you have a chance to get out safely in your landscape. We hope where you are, things are safe and or returning to safe very soon. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. In the Landscape is brought to you by King Garden, a full-service landscape design, care, and education company. Enjoying what you hear on our podcast? We encourage you to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen. We'd love to hear from you. So drop us a line at connect at kinggardeninc.com. We welcome show ideas, gardening and design questions, and always corrections. We travel all over North America giving garden talks and leading trainings. Check us out at kinggardeninc.com for our speaking details. And also take a look at our online course offerings for more in-depth explorations of topics covered on our show.